guys, it's Kayla and Jim. Welcome back to another Meteorology Monday. What are we going to talk about today? Today we are going to talk about the great blizzard of January 1978. It impacted the Ohio Valley as well as the Great Lakes region of the U.S. as well as southern Ontario in Canada. This storm is often referred to as one of the most severe blizzards in U.S. history as well as it shut down transportation, schools, businesses for days. And this extremely powerful storm system set some of the lowest sea level pressures on the U.S. mainland that were not associated with a tropical storm or a hurricane. That's right. In fact, this storm is categorized as a bomb cyclone. Yes, and which if you don't know what that is, we did a whole video on that recently. So that's right. if you want to check that out, it'll be linked up here. Check that out after you watch this one. We'll get into the details soon, but before we get started. If you find yourself enjoying this video along the way, be sure to leave a like and subscribe down below. Hit the notification bell so you know when we post and you never miss another Meteorology Monday. As we mentioned before, this storm did impact Canada, but we are going to be sticking to mostly United States details with this storm. And there are a lot of details to go with this storm. So going off of that, we're going to be giving you the highlight reel of this and going into some detail, but not all. And as always, if you want to check out all the resources that we used to put together this case study, they will be linked in the description. Now let's jump into the meteorological setup for this event. On Tuesday, January 24th, 1978, a very strong northern jet stream with maximum winds of 110 knots was diving southward from the Arctic into the northern central plains of the U.S. At the same time, a strong southern jet stream with maximum winds of 130 knots was speeding through the southern U.S. The two jet streams were forced to go around a very large upper level ridge along the U.S. west coast. At the surface, a low pressure system was developing over the southern U.S while a separate low pressure system was moving southeast across south central Canada. Ample moisture was being drawn northward from the Gulf of Mexico ahead of the southern U.S. low. On Wednesday, January 25th, the northern and southern jet streams met up east of the upper level ridge and merged, generating maximum winds around 150 knots. As the day progressed, the southern low underwent explosive development under the merged jet streams. By mid to late afternoon, National Weather Service offices across the Great Lakes and Upper Ohio Valley regions were issuing blizzard warnings for their areas of responsibility. The low would move from the deep south northward towards West Virginia that evening. This low is considered a bomb cyclone as it dropped an incredible 40 millibars in 24 hours. The threshold to be called a bomb cyclone at this latitude is about 24 millibars in 24 hours. That evening, the rain and fog were widespread ahead of the cold front where temperatures were in the 30s and 40s degrees Fahrenheit. Behind the front, Arctic air poured southward into the western Great Lakes and heavy snow started to break out. Around 1 a.m. on January 26th, blizzard conditions were experienced in Cincinnati, Ohio, and moved into the Dayton and Columbus areas a couple hours later. The low would continue to move northward into southeast Michigan by dawn on Thursday, January 26th. As the early morning progressed, a line of storms containing thunder, lightning, and grapple moved into northwest Ohio and southeast Michigan. By 6 a.m. local time, the Arctic front had moved in and changed the heavy rainfall to heavy snowfall, with 60 mile an hour winds and 80 mile per hour gusts. Over the next hour, the temperature would fall from near 40 degrees Fahrenheit to near zero degrees Fahrenheit. Blizzard conditions were felt in Cleveland around 7 a.m. local time. The visibility was near zero for much of the day where blizzard conditions were occurring. Snowfall rates of one half to one inch per hour were common during the storm. As the day progressed, wind gusts of 50 to 70 miles per hour were experienced over much of Ohio with a wind gust to 82 miles per hour at Cleveland. 
there was a report of an ore carrier stranded in thick ice on Lake Erie, just offshore from Sandusky, Ohio, that measured sustained winds of 86 miles per hour with gusts to 111 miles per hour that morning. As the temperatures fell to near zero degrees Fahrenheit that day, howling winds of 50 plus miles per hour caused wind chill values to approach minus 50 degrees Fahrenheit on the old wind chill scale. It was on this day, January 26th, that the third lowest non-tropical atmospheric pressure reading at sea level was measured. As the storm passed over Mount Clemens, Michigan, the barometer read 956 millibars, or 28.23 inches of mercury. Also on this day, the lowest atmospheric pressure from the entire storm was measured at Sarnia in southwestern Ontario, Canada, at 955.5 millibars, or 28.22 inches of mercury. By the morning of Friday, January 27th, the low would continue to pull away into southern Ontario and Quebec provinces of Canada. Even though the low was pulling away, the winds were perfectly oriented to provide many hours of heavy lake effect snowfall along the Great Lakes shore communities. For most areas around the central and eastern Great Lakes and upper Ohio Valley, the significant snowfall lasted between 24 to 48 hours. While some locations received six to eight inches of snowfall, other areas received three feet or more under continuous lake effect snowfall. One location in particular, Muskegon, Michigan, had up to 33.8 inches of snow over the span of four days due to the heavy lake effect snow. The combination of heavy snow and high winds caused snow drifts in some areas to be as high as 20 to 25 feet. Some locations even reported visibilities at or below one quarter of a mile for 25 hours. Some impacts to the state of Ohio were 51 people lost their lives in the storm. Over 5,000 members of the Ohio National Guard were called in to make numerous rescues. Police asked citizens with four-wheel drive vehicles or snowmobiles to transport doctors and nurses to the hospital. Thousands of trees and many miles of power and phone lines were down due to the widespread wind damage. This resulted in hundreds of thousands of homes left without power and heat, and many important communication lines were down for many days. Massive snowdrifts reaching 15 to 25 feet high caused many roofs to collapse. In addition, these massive drifts brought just about all means of air, rail, and highway transportation to a complete standstill for many days. The entire length of the Ohio Turnpike was closed for the first time in its history. Impacts to the state of Michigan included Michigan Governor William Milliken declared a state of emergency and called out the Michigan National Guard to aid stranded motorists and road crews. The Michigan State Police pronounced Traverse City, Michigan, quote, unofficially closed, end quote, and warned area residents to stay home. Marty Spaulding, a radio staffer at WTCM who lived 10 city blocks away from the Bayfront Station, closed the station the previous night at 11 p.m. and was called to reopen it the next day at 6 a.m. due to others not being able to make it to work. Upon arriving after a 45-minute walk in waist-deep snow from his home, he had to dig down a foot to put the key in the front door. Impacts to the state of Indiana. Whiteout conditions occurred at the Indianapolis International Airport on January 25th, about a half hour after the front passed. The airport was closed due to whiteout conditions. At 3 a.m., the blizzard produced peak winds of 55 miles per hour. Temperatures dropped to zero degrees Fahrenheit that morning. Wind chills remained at 40 to 50 degrees below zero nearly all day. Governor Otis R. Doc Bowen declared a snow emergency for the entire state the morning of the 26th. Snowdrifts of 10 to 20 feet made travel virtually impossible, stranding an Amtrak train and thousands of vehicles and travelers. During the afternoon of the 26th, the Indiana State Police considered all Indiana roads closed. Indiana Bell was forced to halt all phone traffic except for emergency calls. In Franklin, the Daily Journal published on pink paper, explaining that the color would help readers find the papers better in the snow. Additional facts include, in London, Ontario, Canada, they measured 16 inches of snow and 80 mile per hour winds. Several weather stations in the storm's path had to readjust their barographs as station pressures fell below the initial chart scale. President Carter declared a federal disaster in Ohio on the 26th and in Indiana the following day. Area governors activated the National Guard in Ohio, Kentucky, and Indiana. 
Thousands of active duty men and women put in long hours to help clear roadways, restore power, perform emergency rescues and evacuations, deliver food and medicine, and transport medical personnel to hospitals. Several Indiana National Weather Service employees who were on duty at the time became stranded for up to 74 hours. Some recall staff members trying everything to get some rest, including sleeping on boxes of teletype paper pushed together. To be considered a blizzard, a winter storm must produce sustained winds or frequent gusts greater than 35 miles per hour and be accompanied by falling and or blowing snow that frequently reduces visibility to less than one quarter of a mile for three hours or more. Generally, temperatures will be 20 degrees Fahrenheit or lower in a blizzard. A severe blizzard is categorized by wind speeds of 45 miles per hour or higher, accompanied by a great density of falling and or blowing snow that frequently reduces visibility to near zero, along with temperatures generally 10 degrees Fahrenheit or lower. This storm would be categorized as a rare severe blizzard, which is the severest grade of a winter storm. So there you have it, the great blizzard of January 1978. And the reason why we did this case study was because we are coming up to the anniversary of this event. I don't quite remember this event. I was around. You were young. I was seven, almost eight years old at the time of this event, but it didn't affect us in New York like nearly as much as it did over further to the west and to the south. So the one in February 78, now that one I do remember a little bit more because it was closer to the east coast. But what? can we be Saving that for February? That could be another anniversary I like, case study. I like what you're thinking. Okay. Stick around. <laughs> so if you were impacted by the storm, we want to hear from you. Go ahead and comment below your experience with the storm. While you're down there, again, if you enjoyed what you saw today, be sure to leave a like and subscribe down below. Check out, again, all the resources that we used to put together this case study. If you want a little bit more detail than we gave and Check us out over on social media, Facebook, Instagram, our website, Teach Read page where you can learn all about the basics of meteorology, some introduction to severe weather over on our School of Weather. Until next time, I'm Kayla. And I'm Jim. Thanks for watching. And we'll see you at the next Meteorology Monday. And I don't know what, I think that's it. <laughs> Honestly, it's like eight o'clock at night, so. <laughs>